just a few weeks before elections 2024 and more than four years after the Citizenship Amendment Act was passed by Parliament, the Modi government has notified the contentious and much debated legislation. On the program today, uh, we have a very distinguished panel with us, Abhijit Ayer Mitra, uh, who's of course a strategic affairs analyst, uh, is with us. Welcome to the program. Uh, also, if we can introduce him in the box. And also joining us is uh, General Katoj. General Katoj is of course a military a military veteran. He's, of course, also at uh, the India Foundation. Also joining us is Sanjay Hegde, uh, senior advocate. And also joining us is Zakia Soman. Uh, she's a well-known uh, rights activist who was at the forefront of uh, the, the, the movement to basically uh, restore the right of equality to Muslim women when it came to uh, to triple talaq. Let me, let me actually get uh, started uh, with Abhijit Ayer Mitra, because I've been following your tweets and you have been arguing again and again and again that those who describe this legislation to be anti-Muslim uh, are absolutely inaccurate, that this is about the religious persecution faced by minorities in uh, three countries to be specific, Pakistan, Afghanistan and Bangladesh, the immediate, as it were, neighborhood of India. And it has no impact on Indian Muslims uh, who are full citizens of India. Yet the argument has been made, as you know, that there is an element of exclusion, that it excludes, for example, the Ahmadiyyas of Pakistan, who have certainly faced religious persecution. It possibly excludes Muslims in Afghanistan who have already in large numbers sought safety from, for example, the diabolical regime of the Taliban. To those who say that this legislation, now that it's notified, is anti-Muslim. Abhijit, let me start with you. What would you say? say it's largely misinformation because let's be clear the CAA is merely a fast track process I think anybody who's applied for a UK uh, visa will know that if you pay something extra like 80,000 rupees you get on the fast track the three-day fast track kind of thing and this is a persecution based fast track of it that is it there is no exclusion of any Muslim applying to be a citizen of India in fact if you go to Lajpat Nagar in Delhi you'll find a whole host of uh, Afghan uh, Muslims out there many of whom are applied to be citizens of India, one or two of whom have apparently even got their citizenship of India. There is that famous Pakistani singer as well who got the citizenship of India, well after CA passed in parliament apparently. And uh, the only element of exclusion, let's be, uh, because we need to address this exclusion in terms of fast track, not exclusion in terms of citizenship. Why is that fast track exclusion being applied uh, to uh, uh, Muslims? Uh, because there is a certain security process in vetting people coming from Bangladesh, Pakistan and Afghanistan for obvious reasons. And we should remember it is only being applied to these three states. It is not applied to, say, other states which have persecuted the Hindu minorities horribly. Bhutan, for example, got rid of 20% of its population in the uh, uh, late 80s and uh, early 1990s. Uh, you have uh, Sri Lanka where we've seen exactly what has happened. No exclusion has been made for them. It is very specifically for these three countries and the exclusion from the fast track, not from citizenship, is very specifically because of security concerns where there is some extra vetting required. This is a tool which Pakistan can, will and in all probability almost certainly will use, uh, especially when things go further south there as they already are. Okay, let's open this up then. Uh, Sanjay Hegde, uh, it's clear to me that you have a very different perspective. And uh, people like yourselves have argued that uh, this goes against the kind of constitutional principle of equality of all religions. You've heard what Abhijit Ayer Mitra had to argue. You've heard what supporters of the government have said that this is actually zero impact on the citizenship of Indian Muslims. You're really actually talking about illegal migrants having an opportunity at naturalized citizenship. Uh, this is, of course, I should say the Indian Union Muslim League has challenged uh, the, the, the notification in the Supreme Court today. There will be legal challenges. But as a senior lawyer, what do you say to what you've just heard Abhijit say? Sanjay. Well, at the end of the day, uh, Abhijit will also have to concede that as far as the fast track is concerned, you are discriminating on religious lines. There is no other 
identity marker on the basis of which you are discriminating. If you belong to any non-Muslim religion, then you have an opportunity to stand in the fast track. Otherwise, you do not. That very principle of religion-based discrimination runs contrary to the Indian constitution, the Indian dream. We brought in a country where everybody was to be treated alike, irrespective of religion, language, or any, any other identity marker. This is the first time that the government, as a matter of policy, is saying that we will use a religious identity marker to distinguish between those whom we want to fast track the citizenship applications, to use Abhijit's words, and those whom we will, we will pick and choose among, or, or come on a slow track, or, what, or, or uh, whatever unpreferred track that is available. That, on principle, a lot of us disagree, a lot of us think is unconstitutional, manifestly arbitrary, and the petitions are pending in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court will no doubt deal with them eh, according to eh, whatever is the roster and, and their convenience. Today, however, all that has happened is that rules under the legislation have been brought in. The rules operationalize the amendment. Now, for four years, there was no stay on it. The government could have done it at any point of time, but the government chose not to. Right now, on the very day that the Supreme Court gave its uh, verdict in the electoral bonds, maybe they, uh, the government thought that it was an opportune moment to turn the conversation to something else. And the rules have come in. The rules can't go beyond the Act. If we say that the Act is unconstitutional and the court agrees, then, the, then these rules will fall with the Act. So today, I do not think that there is any cause for extra concern. The original concern that was expressed continues and it will have to be dealt with. Okay, so in, in a way what you're saying is the concerns that existed four years ago continue to exist today. There's no change. Uh, there is, of course, uh, been a marked difference in, in, in the sort of much more muted legal response this time compared to the kind of steep street protests, for instance, we saw at places like Shaheen Bagh in the national capital uh, in 2020. I want to come back to Abhijit briefly before I go to General Katoch and Zakia Soman. But I want to play out for you Shashi Tharoor, uh, opposition congressman. Uh, he's, he, he's objecting very vociferously uh, to this new legislation. Take a look. What about the Tasneem and Nasreen? What about the Dawood Haider? What about people who have come from Pakistan who may have been born Muslim, but who have rejected that country and who have been persecuted in that country? Why should they be left out? The whole point is in our country, we do not discriminate on the basis of religion. Afghan Muslims have come here. Are they now going to leave them out? What is this? The, what kind of politics is this? It's very petty communal politics. It's a dog whistle to people whose mentality is communal and they want to polarize voters of that stripe. It's not acceptable to us. And we have every intention of withdrawing this law in this form uh, as soon as we get elected and come to power. So, uh, Abhijit, let me ask you to comment on some of those examples. What about the Taslima Nasri? Uh, right. What about uh, all of the sort of Afghans that India has generously and wisely opened its doors to, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to offer protection? What about... Okay, Rohingyas or Myanmar, you can say it's after 2014. What about the Tamils, the Hindu Tamils of Sri Lanka? And I bring this up in particular because in 2022, the Madras High Court, and actually we have those, uh, that, that, that observation by uh, Justice Swaminathan, the Madras High Court said that though Sri Lanka is excluded from the list, the principles of the CAA, the principles behind the CAA apply equally to them. Hindu Tamils have been a victim of a specific racial strike. So if religious persecution is indeed the, re the reason, then why these exclusions, Abhijit? 
Uh, so firstly, it's the immediacy of the religious persecution. The Sri Lankan conflict ended in 2008 or nine, if I'm not mistaken, number one. The uh, uh, the eviction of almost 20% of Bhutan's population, the uh, so-called Nepalese Hindus, uh, happened in the 1980s or 90s. It is not a current and ongoing situation. And this is a situation that can be dealt with diplomatically. With Bangladesh, it is tougher. With Afghanistan, it is non-existent, just as it is with Pakistan, number one. One. Number two, Taslima Nasreen was offered citizenship on many, many occasions. I think anybody who knows uh, Delhi knows this. She chose Swedish citizenship and she gets a really large stipend, the social security from the Swedish government, uh, which enables a fairly comfortable lifestyle living in India. So that was Taslima Nasreen. What I am upset about is that me being an atheist, I have been excluded. What about my fellow atheists in Pakistan, Afghanistan or Bangladesh who will be killed out there? We have been excluded from it, as have Jews, as have Rastafarians, and as have Scientologists. So is this an anti-atheist law? Is this an anti-Scientology uh, uh, law? Is this an anti-Rastafarian uh, 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 law? Let's be clear about something. There is a very specific reason that this can and will be used by the jamaat e islami in Bangladesh and the uh, 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 forces that be in Pakistan and Afghanistan to send in certain people who might be security threats. That vetting process simply cannot be let go of. There is extra vetting when you come from that country. Second, more importantly, it amounts to a relitigation of partition. Let's not forget, India was for everybody, but Pakistan was very specifically for Muslims. We don't get into intra-Muslim strife. In India, Ahmadis are recognized as Muslims. It is Pakistan which does not recognize them as Muslims. In but fact, in a way, in but in a way, if I may, if I may interject briefly, in a way, are we not actually uh, uh, renegotiating uh, the position we took at partition where we said, as you just said, that we are for everybody. We are for everybody, right? We are, we are not only for specific minorities in the neighborhood. We are the great all encompassing civilizational nation called India. Yes. That should be generous to the Rohingyas of Myanmar, to the Shias of, of Pakistan, to the Hindus indeed and the Sikhs of Pakistan, to, to anybody who seeks shelter because they feel safer here. Why not? Absolutely. And nobody is denying any of them citizenship. But you brought up a very important example, the Rohingya, which is something worth looking at. I want you to follow the uh, 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 Rohingya uh, uh, militant outfits Twitter handle. I forget what it is, but I'll get it to you. Uh, Understand where that Rohingya problem, the current Rohingya problem started off. It was a calculated attempt with significant, uh, at that time, what we thought was ISIS, but it turned out to be more uh, Al-Qaeda infiltration into the Rohingyas, going and attacking a Burmese police post, which killed about 100 or more uh, Burmese soldiers, deliberately knowing that the Burmese army would overreact and waiting for intervention. I want you to go through the history of that. My colleague Angshuman Chaudhary has actually done a long paper on this, that they understood proportionality, they understood the law of retaliation, and how they were actually calling for third-party intervention to come in. Now, if you get that same unvetted, and we have no way of doing a security verification of all the Rohingya who came in to figure out who were militants and who were not, etc., which is exactly proving my point why extra vetting and no fast track needs can be applied out there. Okay. Uh, I, I know uh, uh, Jeru Katoch and Zakia are waiting. Sanjay, very briefly, uh, you had an inter interjection. Sanjay Hegde. Brief interjection is how do you know that a Hindu from Pakistan who's asking for uh, citizenship? is not a spy good question you, you just can't make out you just can't make yeah. out so they so yeah. therefore you treat everybody equally that's all i'm saying you you absolutely cannot make out totally true but the fact remains that the probability is much lower that okay, so is an inarticulate major premise that i that is not an inarticulate it is it is, it is purely statistical you it are essentially saying that somebody who's a Muslim is, is more likely to be a, a traitor in your in what is your inarticulate premise, uh, a, a Muslim, traitor to India, than, than, a than Muslim somebody Pakistani. who's a Hindu or a, a, or, a, or, a, or a Sikh or something of that kind. 
So that a is Muslim where, Pakistan that is the is statistically that is the message okay, that one at a time, we please. all object to. Okay, Abhijit, I think the point that we, that is being made, and I'll, I'll I'll let you respond literally in one sentence because the other two guests have been waiting very patiently. Uh, is that basically you're saying more Muslims coming in from these countries are likely to be terrorists than Hindu, Sikhs, Par Parsis, Christians, uh, or Buddhists? That is the point you're making. Absolutely, and there is a reason for it. Statistically, a Muslim from Pakistan fundamentally accepts the two-nation theory and will have a much greater affinity towards the ideology of Pakistan, as it is called. Otherwise, they wouldn't be a Pakistani. Okay. But this is not just about Pakistan. This is also about other countries in the neighborhood. And that's where the debate actually gets a little more complex. Uh, uh, Zakia Spoman, do you as an Indian Muslim, and as, as I said in my introduction, somebody who has been at the front line of rights, of, of equality between men and women in your own community, you're a trailblazer, is this an issue that impacts Indian Muslims or is this an issue that impacts illegal migrants? W whatever we think about it, uh, you know, because I, I want to play out before you respond what Asad Ovesi, and I don't know if you'll agree, what Asad Ovesi said today. Take a look and then respond. CAA ko, aap sirf CAA se nahi, CAA ko, aapko NPR aur NRC se jod kar dekhna zaruri hai. क्या अमित शाह पार्लियामेंट में मेरा नाम लेकर नहीं कहे थे कि ओवीसी जी एनपीआर एनआरसी भी आएगा क्या अमित शाह कई टीवी इंटरव्यूज में नहीं कहा था कि एनपीआर एनआरसी आएगा जब सीएबी था बाद में सीडब्ल्यूए वो एक्ट हो गया वो जब सीएबी बिल था जब उनका ऑन रिकॉर्ड इंटरव्यू है पार्लियामेंट में उन्होंने कहा है तो ये सब एक धुआं है और ये कोशिश कर रहे हैं कि असल इनका मकसद क्या है कि देश में एनपीआर हो एनआरसी हो ओके जाकिया सोमन शुड दिस कंसर्न इंडियन मुस्लिम्स या सो सो बरखा नोबडी कैन हैव अ प्रॉब्लम विद माइनॉरिटीज इन द नेबरहुड फाइंडिंग शेल्टर इन आवर लार्ज यू नो सेक्युलर डेमोक्रेटिक कंट्री बिकॉज़ वी आर द लार्जेस्ट कंट्री इन द सबकॉन्टिनेंट एंड वी हैव अ हिस्ट्री एंड ट्रेडिशन ऑफ accommodation and we have been open to all kinds of people who have come here so so nobody can have a quarrel with the minorities finding asylum here on a quick basis but my problem is with the principle here you know that the very thinking at the heart of this law you know which is the, the religion has been made basis to prioritize certain people and exclude a community that is the problem because i do not my india uh, is not a country where people will be uh, given uh, the, the 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 protection of a law based on whether they are hindu or muslim or uh, or christian or or sikh uh, on the one hand we are trying uh, so hard for national unity for national integration we have had the whole uh, you know discourse around the uniform civil code and here uh, you know this kind of uh, divisive thinking which is at the heart of the law such as ca is high, high, highly highly object, objectionable according to me it is discriminatory because it is violative of the principles of the constitution which tells me that i am as much an indian as anybody else you know why do you, an indian, why, why why do you feel today that your indianness and i'm not asking this is in in an adversarial way i'm asking this because i think our audience should understand the sentiment that's driving your response why do you feel that your indianness is in, in is somehow under question you're a citizen of india this law doesn't impact you in any which way uh, there are two 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 reasons for me barkha one one is the way the government has devised this whole law you know whereby uh, religion x y z and the muslim religion out that is one second is there is also uh, uh, the the in the process there is this uh, national uh, register uh, of citizens you no know, nrc and we have seen what has happened in assam and we have seen lot of indians uh, including very old people including people who are you know who have been living in assam for three or four generations they have been you know put in detention centers so and this whole uh, rhetoric is highly problematic for me how can uh, those uh, sitting in government deploy this kind of a uh, rhetoric whereby the citizenry is divided along uh, lines of religion that is that is unacceptable for me if at all uh, the government sh should try to first and foremost get the goodwill of their uh, our own indian minorities 
you know, uh, uh, the bona fide worry about minorities in the neighborhood uh, can be substantiated further by taking our own minorities on board, taking them in confidence, explaining to them, where is that effort, Bartha? There has not been any such effort. In fact, a lot of people who have been uh, 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 affiliated with the, you know, with the Sang Parivar, uh, they have uh, gone on to say that this is, you know, all kinds of irresponsible things, othering the Muslims, dividing, uh, you know, the, the Muslims. So, so, so uh, this is not, uh, this is not something which is good for our nation. It is not good for yeah. national integration. And it's also uh, uh, discriminatory and violative of the constitutional provisions of justice and equality for all Indian citizens. Okay, General Katoch, let me let me bring you in. I, I think I've heard two kinds of arguments so far. One is Avijit's that this is a fast track citizenship opportunity. No one is saying that no Muslim from any of these other countries can get citizenship, but it's the fast track option. Uh, and 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 his point is that the vetting process for, for you know among uh, Muslims who may be applying for citizenship to Pakistan is a much more sensitive matter, or even Afghanistan or even Bangladesh compared to other religious communities. And there is Zakia and Sanjay Hegde's argument that yes, it doesn't impact Indian Muslims, but there is a signal, and the symbolism is a divisive one. What do you say, General Katoj? Well, thank you, Marka. Marka, let me give you my views. It may be different from all my very distinguished panelists here. You know, I think when I look at this, and I look at it totally objectively, let me, you know, firstly, let me uh, address the constitutional issue, you know, that has been talked about. Um, Article uh, 11 of the Constitution gives you that power to legislate. It was done in 1955 based on uh, Article 11 of the Constitution. And based on that only, uh, you see, um, the definition of who's going to be a citizen of India was done. This, this took place in 1955, one. Now, uh, if an amendment to that has been carried out again by the con by the parliament as a constitutional, then it is constitutional. The high court, uh, the, let the apex court strike it down and Sanjay, Mr. Sanjay Hagan is shaking his head. Well, you're a lawyer, you can, right? Many people shook their heads on 370, right? Many people shook their head on so many things. That's all right. The, the, the apex court will decide, not Sanjay Hagan on me, and that will go to the apex court and I know which way it's going to go. I've got no doubts about that also. But the second point I think is more important. You see, let us go back to history. And uh, I want to talk specifically about the Nehru Liaquat Pact uh, of 1950. I think April 1950 was the pact. Now, two things, two things happened in that pact. You know, they were looking at two specific issues. One was a lot of refugee movement had taken place up and down, you know, and uh, people who had come, their property was on the other side. So how to secure those people? That was one of the issues which was discussed. And the second point, which, which brings me down to this particular debate, which was discussed, was protecting the minorities in your respective countries. Now, Mr. Nehru, the Prime Minister of India at that time, made a statement and he told Yaqat, our constitution has been made and we give Indian Muslims the, uh, the constitutional guarantee, guarantee that they will be protected. And Yaqat said, we have made the objective resolution in which we are giving the same provisions. Now, what did the objective what did the objective uh, resolution say? The objectives. It's a very important thing which happened that time, 1949. The first thing it said that sovereignty belongs to Allah. First thing, the very first sentence of that, you know. That means, you know, what happens to the minorities? And once you say sovereignty belongs to Allah, then of course Allah is not going to come down to say, uh, you know, to make you sovereign or, uh, you know, to give you dictates. It is going to be people from the religious fraternity. So that gave power to the mullahs to interpret the will of Allah the way they wanted it politically. So they became political. Now, Islam becomes political specifically because of that uh, yeah, in Pakistan. Now, what happens after that? So systematically, the non-Muslims were persecuted. They were persecuted and they continue to be persecuted till date. Just recently, there was a, a young girl. I think she was about nine or ten years old. She was taken off forcibly married to a 60-year-old man, and when it went to the courts, they sided with the man. I mean, it is something which is unbelievable, and that happens to the minorities. It doesn't happen to the Muslims. So now when we talk about giving those people... and It, no it, one happens, to, it happens to groups of Muslims, though. It does happen to groups of Muslims. No, no, just a minute. The, the, the Shias, the Ahmadiyyas, it does happen no, to them, no, the Hazaras. No. Their, their children are not kidnapped and their women are not raped. They are killed for being Shia, 
that is sectarian, that is not religious. I, I want to get these things very clear. But the Hindus, the most, the Christians, the, the Sikhs, etc., they are killed because of the, you know, they call them kafirs. They said, you're not part of us. Now, when, when that was, the, you see, there was an understanding at that time, even in the Liaquat, uh, uh, the Nehru Liaquat meeting, that, okay, people are persecuted, we'll accept them back. Nehru said that. More importantly, Mahatma Gandhi said that. He said to all my persecutors, and he used the terms Hindus and Sikhs. He said, if you if we are being persecuted there, we will take you back. He didn't say Muslims. Now the question, why, why, why not Muslims? I mean, you asked for a country, you got it. Now, now you want to say you want to come back, then give us the land back too. You can't, you know, you can't have, okay, we have produced so many people. Pakistan has grown seven times since independence. Now, they don't know what to do with that population because they do nothing else but produce babies. Bangladesh is the same same thing. Now, what do they do? They say, okay, what do we do with the surplus population? Send them to India. And India is a very intolerant country, as you know, so many people say. We hate Muslims. We don't like anybody. Yet, every Muslim wants to come to India. And no Indian Muslim wants to go to Pakistan or Bangladesh or to any of the Arab countries. But doesn't so, that prove, <laughs> sir, sir, no. doesn't that actually prove no, and this is, this is what I want to understand. This is what I actually want to understand. When we're talking about this particular law, it is only for those very few persecuted minorities who are still there and who have been in India for a very long time. Now, if a Muslim, uh, you know, if a Muslim or a, or anybody else wants to seek shelter in India, there is a law. They can do okay. it. Okay. There is no let's, discrimination on that law. Let's and let's actually. Yeah. Let's pick, okay. let's pick up this idea of in of and I agree with you. no Indian Muslim wants to go to Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan. Uh and I, I, I'm sure Muslims from these countries, among others, could could uh, make India their home if we allowed them to. Why would we not just a thought and a question for you all to think about? Why would we not flaunt that as a statement of soft power? Why would we not flaunt that as a statement of our distinctiveness in this neighborhood? That's one question to think about. The other is, what about the Northeast? Something we haven't spoken about is that the CAA does not apply to several tribal areas as they are identified in the sixth schedule. And one second, sir, just to complete my question, and also to states that are governed by uh, the, uh, the, the, the the sort of ILP, the, uh, as you know, General Katoj, you were wanting to respond to that. And then I wanted to clear out Himanta Biswa's statement. Yes, General Katoj. Yeah, you see, what you know, the Northeast have served for a very long time there, and I know the intricacies. You know, yes. inner line permit, which was drawn there, you know, in, in, like in Mizoram, if you have to enter, there's an inner line. So when you come to Ling Pui Airport, you know, you got yes. to give that pass, you know, whatever it is. I, as the army chap, didn't have to do it, but all this, my civilian friends had to do it. Now, this is, this is historical, the inner line permit. It applies to those areas. It doesn't apply elsewhere. So wherever there's an inner line permit, uh, it, it won't apply because of certain other historical reasons. But Okay. Okay. I want to talk about ASAP. Uh, a BJP governed state where Himanta Biswa Sarma has to now contend with opposition organized protests. And uh, he gave this statement. And then let's come back and talk about the NRC because the NRC is particularly relevant in the context of Assam. Listen. <laughs> जैसे दोनों पक्ष में दोनों पक्ष का आर्गुमेंट है असम का पहले भी एक कानून था आईएमडीटी कानून जब कोर्ट में गया था कोर्ट ने फैसला लिया और कोर्ट ने ही वो कानून को रिपील किया संसद में का पारित हो चुका है का का रूल भी नोटिफाई हो चुका है जो भी लोग का का विरोध करता है वो अदालत जा सकता है असम का स्थिति और असम का हालत खराब ना हो और आसाम एक पीसफुल स्टेट बने रहे यही हमारा लक्ष्य होना चाहिए और इसी दिशा में मैं सबको आगे बढ़ने के लिए अपील भी कर रहा सो अ वेरी कॉशियस म्यूटेड स्टेटमेंट फ्रॉम द आसाम चीफ मिनिस्टर लेट्स ओपन दिस अप संजय हेगडे देन अभिजीत आयर मित्रा यस संजय वेल इट्स प्रिसाइसली बिकॉज़ ऑफ व्हाट हैपेंड इन आसाम दैट ऑल दीस फियर्स ऑफ द एनआरसी एंड द सीए हैव स्प्रेड टू द रेस्ट ऑफ इंडिया I speak with some competence here because I've done all these CA cases and the NRC cases from Assam. You see, Assam, uh, at the time of independence, the uh, 
it was an administrative measure to uh, note down who all were citizens because a lot of people kept crossing the borders. That was an incomplete NRC in, in various places. Nobody knew who, who was registered, who was not registered. We had a Chief Justice from Assam, who is now a Rajya Sabha member, who had a history teacher who once said that one way of finding out who exactly a continues, uh, who's exactly a genuine citizen is to update the NRC. And uh, when he was on the Supreme Court, that, that was the order that was passed. That let us update the NRC so that in, so therefore we will find out who exactly are citizens and who are not who are not citizens. Now there's a, a principle in data science: garbage in, garbage out. You started with an incomplete list. You tried to update it. You caused great administrative chaos to Hindu and Muslim alike, and finally you came out with a result which satisfied no one. In fact. A large number of Hindus were left out of the NRC. They couldn't prove they couldn't prove their citizenship. Now what you, you saw that uh, Mr. Biswa Sarma was rather cautious in what he said. He said that look, there are two sides: those who like the CA, those who don't like the CA. Now, who are those two sides? Who are the people who are actually opposing the CA in Assam? They are the Assamese themselves. They fear that if the CAA ends up granting citizenship to a whole host of Bengalis of any religion, they, uh, the ethnic composition in Assam could change. So what happens in Assam affects the rest of the country. And I have seen, I had, I had to negotiate at Shahin Bagh also. I had to talk to a lot of people. And there is a genuine, genuine fear which is being brushed aside. Okay. Today, yes, I do. Today, there, there's a lot of dialogue that requires to be done. And you cannot rule by diktat in matters of citizenship of granting it or taking it away. Okay, yes, I do remember Sanjay Hegde, the court asked you to mediate with the protesters uh, at Shaheen Bagh. This time around, we have not uh, seen, except for sporadic street protests, uh, too much public demonstration. I think people have chosen those who oppose it to go the legal route. But Abhijit Assam does point to the complexity of the citizenship debate. And I think Sanjay is accurate in saying that the protests in Assam have nothing to do with religion uh, per se. Right. Uh, uh, right. And I think that's important to that's understand me. that the that Sanjay's argument would be as unacceptable in Assam as your argument would be. And that is the complexity of the debate. Uh, but do go ahead exactly. with the larger points made. Yes. See, so this is the curious thing. The same people Sanjay says uh, are protesting against the CAA want the NRC because it is that very crowd which does not want Bangladeshi Hindus who have come in or Bangladeshi's period who have come in uh, because remember, uh, the Muslims there, like Sanjay very clearly pointed out, also do not want uh, the nature, the Assamese nature of Assam to be diluted, which is something we accept in the constitution going in by, uh, for the linguistic uh, uh, division of states. Even at that time, it was pointed out as very dangerous because language was the basis of nationhood in Europe. Uh, Europe's definition of nationhood is linguistic. And that was something very dangerous to bring in, but it was. And yet the complexity also is that uh, Sanjay will probably quote the same people as opposing the NRC when the same people he quotes support uh, opposing the uh, CAA. Uh, and that's my point. Neither, ne neither of your arguments holds it's, completely in Assam. Neither of your arguments. So uh, absolutely true. So Assam and I would add many other parts. This would be a very complex issue. Now, let's talk about the tribal areas because this complexity extends to the tribal areas. You know, in the tribal areas in the Northeast, uh, you know, tribes were split during partition because there wasn't a very clear census. So intra-border marriage is extremely common out there. You look at the Chittagong Hill Tracts, you look at the Arakan Hill Tracts, uh, you look at Meghalaya and things like that. Intermarriage is extremely common and there is no we don't even know what kind of logistical basis to be used, statistical basis to be used to implement it out there. It is fundamentally unknown because the only NRC or even CA that can take place there is to go ask the village elders, Ki bhai, uh, uh, do you have family histories and family records and things like that? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is So this can only apply 
to areas where there is a reasonable expectation of documentation to have existed. And I'm talking about the NRC now. Uh, and with the CAA, what that will do with Assam very specifically is it will not kick out migrants from Bangladesh or East Pakistan as they were once upon a time, but it will remain, it will see to it that the constitutional provision of an Assamese nature of Assam or a Bihari nature of Bihar or as have you will be respected. Right. Uh, and to my larger question, uh, you know, if indeed, you know, General Katoch mentioned the historic difference that at the time of partition, there were those who chose a theocracy and there were those who chose the idea of India. And today, General Katoch's argument is you made your choice. You, you know, you, you made your bed, now, now lie in it. Let's reverse that argument for a moment. There is a country called the United States of America. One of its central sort of principles of nationhood is that it is a country of immigrants. You know, it's, it, it is. And, and, and it uses that in a way to brandish uh, uh, a lot of its influence in the world. Because people from all over the world come to these, the United States of America. Right. Could there have been an opportunity for us here that we missed if had we just said, religious minorities that are persecuted irrespective of religion. That is my only point. I don't think any of us have any other point of debate in this. Abhijit? Absolutely. But, uh, but uh, Barkha, let's look at the America example exactly. See, they brought about that, uh, what was it, the Jason Vanik or the Vanik uh, uh, Act sometime in 1970, which was aimed very specifically at Soviet Jews. Soviet Muslims and Soviet Buddhists were not included, even though Stalin wiped out the entire Russian uh, uh, Buddhist uh, uh, clergy. They wiped out the entire Central Asian Muslim clergy. They were excluded from that act. It was very specifically applicable only to Soviet and uh, uh, Eastern Bloc Jews. Number one. Number two, the problem of having this approach. This is the same country that valued uh, immigrants of all sites. You saw uh, Indian migrants go in the 20s and 30s. There's that famous case of the ship. I forget the name of the ship, uh, which got made into a movie. Uh, there were Italian immigrants, mm. there were Irish immigrants and all of that. Today, you are seeing a reversal of that same stand precisely because of unchecked immigration from the southern border into America. There is a huge pushback against it and we will see it translate into policy. I would say, in fact, to remain the warm, welcoming country that you are, you accept. Nobody is saying we do not accept immigrants. Nobody is saying we will not give refuge to uh, uh, people who are persecuted. However, there are checks and balances in place. It will not be allowed unchecked and natural processes will be followed. Okay, Zakia, uh, the, the point is true that immigration or migrants is a political hot potato globally you know in the united states of america you actually have some of the, some of the southern states shipping them by the bus loads uh, to democrat states saying you support this you keep them you look after them in england there's this entire debate of send them back on the ships right uh, we are not the first country to be looking at this uh, in, in in a way that often divides us you've heard all the arguments are you more convinced uh, not at all. In fact, uh, you know, this is kind of a selective picking out from each uh, country where, you know, want to, we want to justify the CAA. That's fine. But we have always been accepting Hindu migrants from Pakistan. Uh, I belong to Gujarat, on, in Gujarat and Rajasthan. There are a whole lot of them. They undergo a process and then they are awarded citizenships. Regularly, we, I, I know people who work, you know, to expedite the, those citizenships. So that is the spirit which has to be uh, kept alive. But, uh, you know, CA in its present form is, I don't know how it is helping our society. It is polarizing our society. It is giving huge sense of fear and insecurity to, to the largest minority, namely the Muslims. It's also a question of priorities, Barkha. You know, we are on the cusp of uh, yet another general election. Uh, there is a, the, you know, there are so many other priorities, the economy, the young people needing jobs, you know, uh, post-COVID, the health uh, uh, facilities for the poor Indians. There are so many other priorities. Why do we want to pick out, you know, CAA and displease and give insecurity to our own uh, citizens, you know, and, and a sizable okay. number of our own citizens? So it's also a question of uh, how 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 empathetically and compassionately policies and laws are rolled out. 
I think that is very, very important it's when we are taking example. We certainly do not want to follow the example of Pakistan in, in any which way. And General Saab, uh, I, I beg to differ because uh, so many of them who migrated to Pakistan at that time, they are long dead and gone. And I'm sure a lot of the children and grandchildren admire India for what it is, for, for the kind of, you know, liberal democracy that we are. So, Actually, so, so it's... It's also a leadership position that we have in the subcontinent. And I think we should be quite mindful of that. I, I'm glad you brought up this point about partition because I did want to, you reminded me that I wanted to say that, you know, partition when it took place, General Katoch, and I know Abhijit, you have one brief interjection, but just to make one point before I forget it, partition when it took place, a lot of people thought it was temporary. They didn't fully necessarily understand the redrawing of these borders, the choices they were making. I'm sure there were many who did. But not everybody did. There were also Hindu families who left their homes with just one tala thinking that they'll be able to go back uh, one day. So let's also acknowledge that it was not this very concrete, neat event that took place where people make, made very neat choices for the future. Abhijit, you had a brief interjection, then General Katoch and then Sanjay can have the closing word. Uh, Abhijit? And uh, Barkha, the, uh, I just wanted to re-emphasize the security point. You know, every time I go to America, Israel or the Schengen zone, Almost every single time I have been taken for secondary interrogation. I suspect it has nothing to do with my shady face or my shady looks. And it has a lot more to do with the Afghan, Syrian, uh, uh, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan stamps on my passport. Right. Similarly, every time I have been to Syria, especially Syria and Lebanon, were nightmares because I have several Israeli stamps on my passport and I had to spend almost seven hours at the airport out there doing secondary interrogation. It's very simple. Every country applies a pick and choose selectivity and security screening of countries that they believe are a threat. So there's nothing unusual about it. It is not violative of any human rights. Uh, why would you take a side? A white man who has never been to Pakistan, Syria, uh, Afghanistan and interrogate him when there is a guy like me who. But that's that's that's, that's on the base. That's, that's on the that's on the basis of the passports, not on the basis of the religion. Yes. And this is very much a passport issue. It's Bangladesh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. What passports are they going to have? Taliban okay. issued General passports, Kutus. army issued passports. Well, now you have the Taliban in government, so Taliban issue passports are <laughs> going to be a reality. We do live in strange times. Uh, General Katoch, uh, do go ahead. Sir. I'll, be, yes. I'll be very brief. You know, Zaki Ji has said, you know, there are other priorities. Why take on this? You know, so many things have to take place simultaneously. It isn't that, okay, because we have got to eliminate hunger, we won't do anything else. There are multiple activities which will take place at all times. And I think that is part of the game. I don't, you know, uh, why are people saying this is divisive? It is being deliberately misinterpreted. It does not apply to Indians at all, regardless of which, which Indian you are, what your religious belief is. It applies to specifically three countries. And that is something which has, you know, which is the leftover of partition, a promise we gave to those minorities. And there was a feeling because the, that the Muslim rulers there will kill, will rape, will do all those things. And that is why that guarantee was given by a person no less than Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, I, if somebody says he was communal, well, so be it. Right. But he gave that and he made that statement. He said, if you Hindus and Sikhs want to come back, we will take you back. Why did he say that? Because of that fear. And now that fear, is, you know, I think the Indian Muslims should look at it in a different way. They should say, though the Muslims in Pakistan and Bangladesh and Afghanistan have done something wrong, we will take our Hindu brothers back. They will not say it. And I think that is where our secularism is lacking. It is one way. This Ganga Jamna Tazeeb is only one sided. I would like it to be both sides. I would like them also to come forward and say, we are with you instead of we are against you. And I think that is the problem of India. And that is something Bharat needs to address now. Barka. Sanjay, what do you think is the immediate ramification? You said that the concerns are not much more than four years ago. But what happens now? It's confusing to me, actually. I was trying to understand because while we know the CA is notified, the NRC is not nationally uh, implemented. The national population of uh, the national, reg uh, what was it, NPR, the national population register. National register. This was, uh, yeah, this was started in 2010, by the way, not even in this government. Uh, so that, that's where this whole story actually started. So what happens now? Well, Right now, what the government has done is to achieve its object of polarization and distraction. That's all that has happened. 
in strictly legal terms things which have to happen will happen only after the elections people will not will have an opportunity to apply for indian citizenship the government will process them in the meanwhile the supreme court will go go ahead and decide whether the law is constitutional or not constitutional but fundamentally this is the objection to this uh, ca that we are a country which does not have a preferred religion or a despised religion we have now at least for the purposes of granting citizenship said that these people are preferred these people please get go to the back of the bus that is the problem all right the debate continues and as you have said i think uh, what happens next other than uh, immediate applications for citizenship for the identified six religious communities from three countries uh, all the legal challenges will possibly uh, unfold only after the electoral verdict is in uh, this has been an interesting conversation we thank all of you in particular for keeping it civil uh, this is a sensitive issue and uh, and i think we've been able to be honest but yet polite and long may our arguments be that way uh, abhijit ayer mitra general katoj sanjay Agde Zakia Soman, a pleasure, and to our audience, thank you as ever for watching. Take care and see you soon. Mojo Story has always made a commitment to its viewers to go to where the story is, and as you can see here, we are at the epicenter of the Israel war on Gaza. We are right at the front line, about one mile from the Gaza Strip, as as the Israeli military gets ready with its tanks and its gunners to begin its final frontal assault that will take troops into Gaza. As we said, we are not like other organizations. We believe in giving you all sides of the story objectively and as much as possible from the ground. And that's exactly what we're doing here, covering the biggest global story today from the epicenter of the war zone. So please, we need your support. Support us, become a Mojo member, subscribe to us, spread the word, and thank you for your support.